Okay, so let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, session of the of the summer student lectures. Uh, today we are extremely lucky to have a, a guest here um, from um, from Imperial College, uh, Marco Babone, uh, who will give us an introduction into FPGA programming. And eventually, what I wanted to mention, Marco, four years ago, was an Open Lab summer student. And uh, today he's writing his, uh, his PhD in, in Imperial College. So that's a place where you eventually could also end up. I would say it's not, it's not the worst. Okay, so uh, over to you, Marco. Thank you very much. So this was a bit of a challenge uh, because uh, when I was a student here in this room, we were all from different backgrounds. And uh, this is more uh, probably targeted to computing student. And so I had to... In making these eyes, I had to like trade off between uh, what is your background and what you expect from here. And uh, one hour and a half, two hours, don't give you like enough knowledge to go. Oh, let's buy an FPGA and play around. Uh, there is more to that, but at least I want to uh, give you how to approach the problem because uh, I think this is some knowledge that uh, it can be brought also in other. Uh, disciplines and other things. Uh, so telling you how to solve problems, I think, is worth more than telling you just write this 10 line of code and it's going to work. You know, the same you do on Stack Overflow. You copy pass, you don't know what's going on, and then you know it works, and then everything is good. But this is not the goal here. So that's uh, why I'm here. Uh, just as Stefan, as Stefan uh, mentioned, I was uh, Open Lab uh, in the past, and after that uh, I s moved. Uh, uh, back to computing in Imperial College, still working with physics. Uh, and uh, I work with FPGAs and Accelerator in general, which is, I think is a very nice topic. Uh, um, very new to me, but uh, I got a hold of it and uh, got here. Yeah. And currently, this summer, I'm also a software engineer at Intel, uh, where I work on modeling and simulating hardware, which is uh, kind of related to FPGAs, but way more complex than that. So, but this, this is not about me, this is about FPGAs. So let's start by telling you what is an FPGA. So basically, an FPGA is an integrated circuit that uh, you can configure to do any computation. So normally, when a, chip's, uh, when a chip comes out of a foundry, it, is, it has a specific function. For example, your CPU is an assembly interpreter. It takes assembly input and it performs the various operations. Uh, and this is what is called an ASIC. And uh, this is most of the chip out there are like this. While FPGAs, on the other hand, you can reconfigure them so that uh, you can make it do whatever you want them to do. Of course, uh, you, want, uh, to, you want the FPGA to do something useful. And I explain you how to and when it's worth uh, using an FPGA to solve your performance issue. So, but before we move into that, I want to just highlight why I care about FPGA. And one of the reasons is because also Microsoft cares about FPGA. And uh, they have an entire deep learning platform to do real-time inference on FPGA because FPGAs are very good at ultra-low latency computations. And they are unbeatable in that uh, kind of scenario. Only an ASIC, a custom circuit, can beat them, but they're more expensive. And you know, you, if you want to change your model, then you need a new chip. So this doesn't scale if you want to have multiple models sharing the same hardware, or you want to run different computation on the same chip, getting, getting very high performance. So this is one of the reasons. Another reason is because anyone can play with FPGA nowadays. So while uh, the upfront cost of an FPGA may be expensive, you can rent out uh, uh, an instance on AWS for like 10 euros, 10 francs, or something, and still have a few hours worth of computation so that you can play around with FPGA. Getting into them nowadays is much easier than a few years back. Other uh, notable example, I put these slides, actually, after uh, COVID, because uh, we all know about vaccine and RNA vaccine and all these kind of things. Well, everything boils down to DNA sequencing and all this kind of technology. 
which made uh, this niche use of FPGA, because they're very fast and very good at this, much more popular than it was a few years back. So I guess for me, for my uh, research, uh, the COVID has been a bit uh, a blessing in these guys, uh, if we can call it that. But yeah, uh, this is getting way more important compared to a few years ago, that's why it's here. And also our research group did uh, some work uh, into this, this topic. And uh, compared to the state of the art, they achieved 18 times the, the speed up, you know. And so you can see when uh, 18 times the speed up means that you can do almost 20 more things for the same amount of time. You can get more things done and much faster. So this is very important in certain scenarios, for example, where you have a limited budget and you want to take the most out of it, or uh, simply you are sharing the resources, so you have limited time access to, to the resources. So this is enough about uh, why I care about this, and let's move on to where they fit into the tool chain in the stack. So basically what FPGA do, they fill the gap between hardware and software, and I want to start uh, from an example here. So if you have an interpreted uh, program, like you're writing Python, at runtime you have uh, the overhead of the interpreter that needs to convert uh, your source code into machine-readable code, into assembly, basically. And this is uh, a cost that you pay at runtime. That's why your Python script usually runs uh, slower than your C++ program, because by compiling uh, the program, you are getting rid of the interpreter runtime and moving this translation overhead to compile time. When you move to FPGA, you remove the assembly from the equation. You are basically configuring the circuit directly. You are uh, basically defining the microarchitecture. So the moment you flash that firmware onto your FPGA, the FPGA can only do your computation. It cannot interpret assembly or do something else. The circuit will do what you programmed it to, to do, which removes the overhead of the, of the assembly, of interpreting the assembly to, to perform an operation and makes uh, your program run faster. There are some caveats to that, and uh, let's assume that for now. So, as we said before, FPGs uh, are reconfigurable substrate. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, you can reconfigure uh, function in the connection of function input output. You can decide the communication protocol, what data comes into the FPGA, what data comes out. And by function interconnection, you can think, for example, if you are doing a multiply add, you need a multiplier and you need an add, and then you need to connect them. So this is what I mean by uh, reconfiguring it. You are instantiating all these blocks, you are connecting them, and this is the, in this way you do what is called the data flow, and this is how you perform your computation without having an instruction counter or assembly. And by filling the gap between higher and software, FPGA can achieve higher throughput than software because you have a specific hardware to do the same computation, and we saw how this can be more efficient by reducing the overhead you can achieve lower latency than uh, software. By the time you do a fetch decode in your software, you might already have done some useful operation towards your computation on addition in your program, so you achieve lower latency. And uh, you have more flexibility than hardware because if you have an ASIC, the moment it comes out to the foundry, you cannot change it. And if there is a bug in the software, then uh, you need to go to the foundry again, do the entire uh, design, fixing uh, the, the bug, and then producing another 1 million units to make up the cost. So you, it's more flexible because you can reconfigure it. But uh, there is something that I want to mention here, and I will uh, tell you more about it later. Higher throughput than software is not always true. Uh, Sometimes software can achieve higher throughput uh, than FPGA, so that's why I say that FPGA are not the solution for everything, but you need to be careful about what you put on the FPGA in order to get higher performance than software. And this is basically about uh, this lecture. We will analyze how to go about it. But let's start from latency. So first of all, about latency, I always uh, speak about latency in terms of microseconds. For example, if your computation takes a week and uh, you want to use an FPGA to make it faster, 
this is not going to change anything. Like, it's not said that uh, by using an FPGA on something that lasts for a week, you can uh, uh, take six days, for example, even though you technically classify this as a latency. When we talk about latency, we always talk about ultra-low latency. So we, the, the unit of measure, the scale, is microseconds. And one more thing, uh, FPGAs are suited for hard real-time problem where not meeting uh, the timing is catastrophic. Think about self-driving car and not braking on time. And you, know, you can think about this kind of scenario where if the reply doesn't come, with enough time, you don't meet the timing, something catastrophic is going to happen. And uh, this is, they are very suited for that because latency is cost and predictable. Basically, you, can, you decide how many clock cycles you need to do the computation. And once you know the clock cycles, you know the clock frequency. Either you impose it or it's given to you by the specifics. And once you have like the number of clock cycles, the clock frequency, you can de do simple arithmetic to get uh, the time out of it. It's a very simple equation, linear equation. Now, uh, CPU are usually not used in ultra low latency because the, just creating a thread takes 10 microseconds. And 10 microseconds is sometimes what it takes for an FPGA to give you an answer. So this is why FPGAs are better at that. And GPUs in thermal latency are even worse uh, because you, know, you need to transfer data to the GPU. So you need to go through the PCX first bus. So you need to uh, talk to the driver. So you need to make a constant system call, take, leave the control to the kernel, do the data transfer, and all these kind of things, which takes at least milliseconds. And uh, by the time you even reach to the GPU to ask it to do something, the CPU and FPGA are long done with their task. And examples are ultra-low latency trading, where a difference of 1 and 50 uh, microseconds make, can make a few million difference in terms of the price you buy the stocks and the price you sell them. So that's why you want to use FPGA in these kind of cases. And also because latency is constant and predictable. If you're buying too late, you might be losing money because the, the price went too high. And so you want to be sure that the moment uh, uh, you buy something, uh, this happens in the time that you want it to happen and you're not losing money. And another application is the thread CERN triggering system. We are at CERN. And basically what happens here, probably you know better than me, but uh, is uh, you have a fixed rate at which uh, collision happens. And by uh, the time the next collision happens, data should be already being processed. And this is a very ultra-low latency problem where you have, I think, 25 milliseconds of time to give an answer. But in these 25 milliseconds, you have the time for the sensor to pick up the signal. Then you have to uh, digitalize uh, uh, the signal. Then you need to transfer it to the FPGA with, over fiber. You know, it's not negligible at that time scale, uh, the amount uh, it takes to travel a few hundred meters to, to propagate the signal. And then you need to process it, and then you give a reply. So the, the, the order of magnitude, the time that you have to, to give an answer, is much less than the time there is between two collisions. And you also want to be constant, because if you're too late, you lose uh, the computation. You lose uh, the event. You, your, your data is going to be overwritten by the next bunch crossing because uh, uh, you don't have a way to stop the collision from happening, and you don't want them to do. You want to keep the collision rate as high as possible. That is to use cases where FPJ actually matters. Moving on to throughput. What I mean by throughput is that you apply the same function on multiple data. This is what I mean. Like you have uh, an array of data, you apply to all of them uh, the same function, and you get some results, OK? And uh, the way you do that on an FPJ is you replicate that function until you run out of space on chip. So you, you replicate this uh, function multiple times, and you achieve high throughput, hopefully. Uh, but as we will see, uh, like uh, GPUs are throughput-oriented device, so in this kind of situation, it's usually better to use uh, GPUs, but uh, it uh, all boils down to the kind of workloads uh, you're trying to accelerate. So I guess job done. Now, like, uh, we all know that if you want to achieve job uh, like low latency, we just uh, buy an FPGA and start uh, you know, playing around with it. But unfortunately, uh, 
the, the bad news is that FPGA costs tons of money. Like, uh, this is, uh, I will say, high-end uh, FPGA, not, not the newest one. It's already a few years old now. So uh, more recent FPGA will cost more. But here we are in the neighborhood of tens of, uh, uh, tens of uh, thousands of dollars. Like, here we are around 9K dollars to, to, to get around uh, with an FPGA. To be fair, enterprise GPU costs around the same price. So if you want to play around with an enterprise GPU, you are willing to, to spend as much money. But on the other hand, uh, 30, a 64-core uh, CPU costs half the price. So the moment you at least double the price of your hardware, because you buy a CPU, then you buy an accelerator, or you buy just a more powerful uh, CPU, so you are doubling uh, at least the, the price of your server, then you need to uh, kind of know in advance that FPGA are going to be faster and meet the performance requirement you have, otherwise you wasted a lot of money. So you need to spend a bit of time before deciding what the FPGA should do to see if it is worth it. Okay, and when it is worth it? When do FPGA ach achieve higher throughput uh, than CPUs and GPUs? And basically, the workload has to have one of these two characteristics. The first is uh, it has to have many branch misprediction, and the second is it has to have many cash folds. If at least one of these is true, then your FPGA is going to achieve low latency, but also higher throughput than software. And what I mean by that, for example, for cash, for cash, you have that if you have an L1 a cache miss, you take two, cycle, two clock cycles to read the value from the cache and bring it into a register to do computation. If you fall into L2 cache, you take 15 cycles into this, onto this CPU. And if you fall on L3 uh, cache, you have a latency of 32 clock cycle. So if your data set doesn't fit into L1 cache, your CPU is going to run 30 times slower. This is still being cached. If you fall to memory, then it's in the order of, of uh, 100 or two, 300 cycles to get data uh, from DRAM. So the moment you have like cache faults or you fall to DRAM a lot, that is where FPGAs are going to be faster. And GPUs are not going to solve the problem because GPUs even have smaller cache uh, than CPU. So if uh, you have a lot of uh, L2 uh, cache misses on the on the on the CPU. The GPU is going to perform even worse in that case scenario. And if you're curious about uh, how the latency in your own CPU, you can use uh, this code to measure it and have an accurate measurement of how much your combination is getting slower by cache misses. If uh, we talk about uh, uh, branches, I want to give you a code example, and this is a really bad piece of code. And uh, I know it's bad because I wrote it, OK? So basically here, what happens is that in this simulation inside your main loop, you're, you have a switch case, then you have a couple of if here. And if we nest into this function, we have another bunch of if. So basically, we have a total of nine branches into 15 lines of code, which is bad, I would say. Now let's try to use perf. Uh, so that you can replicate this if you want to, to uh, capture the cache misses and uh, uh, the misprediction rate, okay? And after running the program for a while, I captured a bunch of samples, uh, 600K, and this is uh, the situation. We have uh, 300, uh, 300K branches and uh, 300K branch missing. So basically, all of the branches are missed in this computation. Now, how this is going to impact performance? Okay, we have a simple for loop here with one branch. This branch is doing an addition. This addition can be done into one assembly instruction, okay? So if uh, the probability of a branch is zero, we, we notice that uh, we only take one clock cycle to do one iteration, okay? Then we say that the probability of the branch increases and when you get around 50%, which is the worst case of a branch predictor, I mean, if it goes either way or on the other way, like a coin flip, there is no way the branch predictor is going to predict properly. So usually it's what is going to happen. They are going to predict always one branch, hope to get it right. You know, 
but once you get here, which is the worst case for a branch predictor, you notice that from one instruction for uh, cycle, for, for, the, for the loop, one clock cycle for loop iteration, you go to 14 in this case, okay? So this is one order of magnitude slower. So now let's do a bit of an exercise. And let's assume that in these 50 lines of code, we only have a 50 assembly instruction, okay? And we have nine branches, which are in the worst case. So they take uh, 14 clock cycles each. We notice that we have uh, 14 lines remaining of instruction plus 14 times nine, which is two order of magnitude slower. So if your computation is very branchy, the CPU is gonna perform two orders of magnitude slower and this is where FPGA do make sense because uh, the moment the, the CPU cannot leverage all the res computational resources available to it, then you gain a very, very uh, high performance by using an, an FPGA. And of course, GPUs are gonna be even worse in this case because uh, you don't have branch predictors on the GPU. So like half of the verbs, if you are using uh, CUDA terminology, are gonna be descheduled. So you're gonna achieve an even lower resource utilization on, a, on the GPU. So, and this is where FPGA do make sense. Uh, the workload needs to have one of these two characteristics at the very least uh, for the FPGA to make sense. Now, let's give you some expans uh, examples. And for example, if first person matrices, you have a lot of cache misses because things are not stored linearly, and so FPGA makes sense. On the contrary, with dense matrices, you basically usually have a, a matrix, and GPUs are very good at linear algebra. Uh, graphs are more or less the same because a dense graph is a matrix, and uh, a sparse graph is an aviation list, so they, they are kind of similar workload. And GNN and CNN are just uh, the application of graphs into neural network, and CNN are linear algebra, and this is where, you know, you use them, you use a GPU for that, and you're gonna be really fast. Decision tree fall into the FPGA category, and we saw our branch misprediction uh, matters into performance, and FPGAs are very good in the case of decision trees. The other is simulation. Like, the code that I show you is a simulation that is not Monte Carlo, I put Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo here because Monte Carlo is more likely to be suitable for FPGA acceleration than a general simulation. But simulation in general work really well onto an FPGA and genomics, we already saw that and there is already commercial software available to it. Okay? Now, an example of simulation here at CERN, for example, is when you have a particle then you need to decide what particle it is, so you're already making a decision. Uh, and here I just put three of them, but as you know from the standard model, there are tons of particles that you might want to simulate. So this branch can be huge, and then you execute some processes depending on the particle that uh, you identified. So here you're making decision, decision, and nested decision, and this is an example where FPGAs are really good. Okay, I think I... I hope I motivated you on the importance of FPGA. Let's move on into some more practical things. And uh, how to program this. Okay, the design flow of the FPGA usually starts from a problem definition. And then you want to use either high level synthesis tools that makes your life much easier, or HDL languages to implement it. You need to know that HDL is lower level than assembly. So like most of the times, writing assembly is easier than writing HDL. So that's why I mentioned that you probably wanna go to the high level synthesis route because this is just a, a software API that you use to, to program your hardware instead of going very low level. Of course, there are trade-offs uh, and I will explain you how, what these trade-offs are. But the moment you have uh, the your HDL description, your HDL code base, then you need to do three steps. First, you need to synthesize the logic, and then you do place and route the logic onto the circuit. Then you generate a bit sim, which is, this is really fast actually, and then you can flash it to program the FPGA. And uh, here, I, there are a few examples of uh, software of uh, HLS tools that you can use. And these are like uh, tools that are used at this step, okay? There are bad news, though. 
Placing a route might take days. And uh, actually might take week, weeks. But you know, this is not always a bad thing because like, uh, think about it. If uh, your code uh, takes five days to compile, you show up in the office on Monday morning, you change a few lines of code, you kick the compilation, you go out for lunch, and you come back to the office uh, the Monday after. So it's a dream job. You should study the FPGA. That's why I'm doing it, okay? So, so like, uh, this, this is, your employer might not be as happy, though, like, uh, to pay you only to work a couple of hours a week, you know? Uh, the, so, you know, like, at this point, they are going to push you to use proper methodology and avoid uh, wasting time uh, waiting for a compilation to end. Fortunately, or unfortunately, I'm sorry, uh, there are ways to get around it. But before we explain about uh, possible ways, uh, I want to just uh, put uh, things in perspective and give you a comparison. So, assumption, nothing is easy, but something can be easier compared to something else, okay? So here, when you write uh, software for the CPU, the engineering time usually is short. You know the algorithm, you apply the algorithm, that's it, okay? And on GPU is medium because you need to also take account of the uh, GPU tool chain, you know, add, uh, use the proper API and other things, which makes uh, your life a bit, uh, a bit more complicated. On FPGA, you cannot just do trial and error and, you know, yeah, let's try writing some code and see if it works. No, that doesn't, doesn't work. The moment you are committed to writing FPGA code, you know that this is going to be a not, mean, not easy task. This is going to require quite a bit of time. Usually what I say is that uh, writing a code, code uh, for FPGA takes uh, one order of magnitude more time than uh, writing it for a GPU. So before you start coding, you need to already be very sure that you're doing the right thing. You, you don't want to do random things. Compilation time for CPU and GPU is short. Takes a few minutes, one hour if you're compiling a huge code base for the first time, but then by doing incremental changes, it takes nothing to it. I compile, and we saw for FPGA what is the situation. I mean, um, exploit it at your advantage. And uh, for debugging, n not, uh, debugging is never easy, but on uh, CPU you have GDB, you have a lot of tools that makes your life easier, which are not available to you. On GPU there is something, so that's why it's medium difficulty. On FPGA you don't really have like a debugger. You can analyze the signals and other things, but usually you go about uh, printing stuff. It's more, it's hard, it's, you don't really have a way to like freeze your computation in time and resume it like you do with a debugger by changing a value. So this is why debugging is harder on an FPGA and maintainability. On CPU is easier. On GPU, you need to be careful about code duplication between CPU and GPU because uh, uh, you might end up writing twice the same thing and then you have twice the same thing to maintain, which is why this is harder. And on FPGA, the FPGA code is very hard even to read in general for if you're writing HDL. So maintainability is a, is a challenge and there needs to be good software practices in place to kind of be able to maintain the code base for a long time. So I guess uh, this is for today. We go home and we say FPGAs are not worth uh, for anything and let's do something else. Uh, but actually there are ways to, to like mitigate uh, these issues to make FPGAs worth your time. So the first uh, thing you can do is to avoid uh, place and route at all. You basically can simulate VHDL without actually executing uh, on a chip. So you can simulate it on your CPU and you can use model scene for that. It's the state of the art so commercial software for that. I don't think there is anything better. And uh, you use that to do validation of your code base before you you wait weeks for it uh, to compile. The only issue is that model theme is low because it's a simulator and there's a bunch of overhead. And uh, with that, you can always execute very small uh, test benches. If you want to run any meaningful computation, you really can't really do that on model theme unless you're willing to wait weeks for it. But at that point, is, isn't it any better to just flash it on an FPGA and then run it on an FPGA? So like, if you just rely on simulation, it gets you so far, okay? But uh, the good news is that uh, since 
few years, not that much, we have HLS. HLS simplifies uh, your life quite a lot. And, uh, for example, starting uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, validation and from simulation, w this is from uh, Google XLS, but all the toolchains support this. You basically take your code base, and instead of simulating it, you can uh, plug an assembly backend to it so that your hardware description gets compiled directly in uh, x86-64 assembly. And this way, instead of running your simulation in a simulator, you can uh, run uh, your code compiled as an assembly on a CPU, which is orders of magnitude faster. And this allows you to do a lot of validation. Uh, and so to make sure that your design is correct in the first place. So you can save up a lot of time by just doing that. Then you move on into a simulation backend. And you want to move into a simulation backend because this does not simulate the hardware characteristics. This accounts for the hardware characteristics. So if you have a flow in your code that is not behavioral, but a flow in how you are configuring the circuits, you're not going to see that here. You're going to see that here at this point. Because if you have a, a mistake in the scheduling, this is scheduling here is not part of the pipeline, as you can see, but it's there. And at this point, if your design is scheduled wrongly, you can see that here. You can fix it, and then you can move to synthesis and actually flash it on a device and uh, you know, test that it really works. And you can do this in parallel. Like once uh, you have uh, a reasonable uh, uh, state of the code base, you can start kicking uh, uh, an hardware build while working on another feature. This way, you know, the, you are not going to wait uh, for the entire code base to be complete before you run it on an FPGA, but you're parallelizing, making sure that things are working properly one at a time by themselves, uh, by alternating what you're doing. Okay? And this is very important. It makes coding FPGA much less cumbersome. Okay? Because you can uh, unit test the code now. Because if you can compile for x86, and uh, it is easy to integrate with the reference code base, which you always have. Like, you always have a reference implementation that you're trying to accelerate. You never start from something, oh, I want to design something specifically for FPGA, unless, uh, I don't know, you're, you are... Uh, uh, trying to implement an hardware a random number generator to feed it into something. Then you might think, okay, I want something that only works on FPGA, and so you, you don't have a reference code base. But even then, you're going to make a reference software implementation so that you can test against it that you are doing the correct thing. So you always have reference software, and now you can unit test it. You can call the, the same FPGA code. Uh, from C++ because everything is going to be compiled in the end into one uh, assembly executable that is going to be executable, which is very good from a software engineering perspective. And uh, like I said, it's much less cumbersome. And just to show you, okay, this is a double floating point uh, multiplication in HDL. It is 12 line of code, okay, and uh, there is something even worse here. This is using a library function. <laughs> so this is what it takes to call a library function to do a fluent in point multiplication on an FPGA. So can you imagine, like, if you were to, like, see what is the code for this multiplication inside the library to, to do this? OK. And if you use HLS, this is, like, your uh, star symbol, OK? So 12 lines of code using HLS becomes one symbol without you bothering with it, and knowing that this is going to be correct, OK? So this is why I say HLS is really important and for many things. Another thing is scheduling. What is scheduling? So in hardware, the way you got it is uh, you put some blocks, you connect them, OK? But the point is, like, this multiplier is going to take a few clock cycles to get the result, OK? Let's assume it takes seven clock cycles, OK? If uh, the input come all at the same time, you have B and C coming here, waiting for seven clock cycles, and then going here, being added to B. So basically, B, A is going to be added to the result of something that uh, should have happened seven clock cycles in the past, which means that you get wrong results. So you need to put a delay here. 
uh, seven clock cycles delay so that all the data arrives when it needs to arrive and it does the correct thing. And here what you're doing is uh, C times B plus A. Very simple, okay? And the good thing about HLS, that HLS is gonna do that for you. If you're writing H HDL, you need to do that by hand. And if you, by chance, have a wrong, you estimate the, the number of clock cycle wrongly because you mistype or you read the documentation wrongly, you get uh, random numbers here. Yeah? You have no idea why, and you have no idea where to investigate the problem, and you're gonna spend the days uh, cursing and uh, you know, uh, working angry around the office just to find, oh, I missed uh, a six, it should have been a seven that, you know? Like, uh, this is why HLS makes your life so much easier and uh, allows you to uh, be less angry when you code, okay? And um, so if uh, we divide the FPGA column and we say FPGA simulation and hardware and we also plug HLS into the equation, we have that what is was all red here now is either green or yellow. Uh, very few, very little is that because placer route is an exponential algorithm, so no matter what you do, it's gonna take a long time if you're filling the chip. So, but in the end, now, the engineering time is reduced from very long to something reasonable, because now writing code for an FPGA is slightly more complicated than writing code for a GPU, which makes the FPGA worthwhile in a whole lo a lot of application where it wasn't until now. So, to recap, there are advantages to HLS because it simplifies program, programming, reduces engineering time by a lot, allows also rapid prototyping because you can easily write uh, an HLS kernel and see the correctness, and if it is a small kernel, you can compile it in about an hour or two and see what is the performance, okay? But you, usually you have statistics about the performance even before running uh, it on hardware, uh, so like this is just if you really want to run a test. Otherwise, very fast, you can look at the statistics and the metrics and see oh, how much time it's gonna take. These advantages is that um, HLS achieves less performance than an unwritten optimized uh, HDL. But this was, if you were going in the 70s when C started to be around, even at the time, uh, writing assembly were was achieving higher performance than writing C and compiling it to assembly. But over the years, compilers got smarter, smarter, smarter. And nowadays, if you write assembly, usually you get worse performance than the compiler because the compiler can make more meaningful optimization than what you can, you, you can spot by looking at the code. So nowadays, it's not worth, in most case scenario, writing uh, assembly. So we believe that by, since HLS is useful, it's gonna continuously be developed until we reach a point where HDL will not really make sense anymore, like it happened with C, okay? Uh, the performance, uh, what I want to mention is that even with using HLS, there is still a significant engineering effort, depending on the size of the problem, to make things work. And still, hardware build takes a significant amount of time, okay? So, what if the FPGA does not perform a salt? Uh, suggestion, what do you do? Like, you, you did a lot of work, okay? You spent time and time, this, uh, the engineering time, uh, you waited weeks for the compilation to happen, now after uh, spending months into these things, uh, you run a benchmark, uh, you see that the performance is bad. What do you do, okay? No suggestion? I will tell you what I will do, okay? I will cry. Uh, at that point, you just wasted six months of your life, if you're lucky, I will just cry. Or what do you do? Like, you can re-engineer the problem, start from scratch, uh, you can, can optimize the code and build several times, you know, the same way we did before, you know. You, you change a couple of lines of code on Monday and then you go home for a week and then you come back the next Monday, you know, this is a possibility. They allow you to do that. But uh, unfortunately in the real world, this is not really how things are. So there is a solution uh, to avoid this thing, it's called performance modeling. But uh, I think is about uh, we take a small break here, 10, 15 minutes. We are back at half past uh, two. So that uh, if you have questions, you can ask questions. 
And if you want to take a break or go away, you can do that. Okay? Questions, please. So I have a question about this compilation. Why the time of, ex of compilation is exponential? I don't see it. Okay. Uh, basically, what you have onto an FPGA is our uh, logic units. Okay? You instantiate uh, these logic units and you connect them. Okay? And now you need to map your design into finding like a good permutation of logic units that allow you to meet timing. What do I mean by that? We are working at a few hundred of megahertz here, which means that the, the electromagnetic field, uh, the time it takes to propagate is the speed of light, okay? Which is not negligible given the time scale, okay? So basically you need to find a permutation that allow your electrons not electrons, your electromagnetic field, to be precise, since we are at CERN, to travel and reach the other function uh, before the next clock uh, cycle reaches, okay? So you need always, you need to account for that, and the way does it work is, is uh, the software has to find a suitable uh, permutation and instantiate the various interconnect and uh, uh, blocks so that the distance is within tolerance so that uh, the electromagnetic field can propagate fast enough, okay? And a quick follow-up question. So um, is it somehow theoretically modeled so that we know that it's, there is this low limit if this is this exponential time or we don't know the better algorithm? We don't have a better algorithm because it's a permutation issue. Like yeah, your lower bound when you're searching for permutation is uh, always going to be exponential. Like so there is a low, so, so there is theoretical lower bound. Yeah, it's, per, it's, it's, per, it's exponential. Yeah. Okay. So the only thing you do is find the heuristics. Like you don't run uh, the 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 thing for like uh, three weeks, uh, like and whatever. Like you, you use a lot of heuristics developed by physicists and other engineer to cut on time, so you know that uh, this thing is gonna work, so you apply it, you know that this thing is likely to work, you apply it. Then you run uh, usually pleasant route with different configuration and different seeds as well, uh, in parallel, so you run multiple configuration, hoping that, because in the end, what you're doing is hill climbing to approximate it, okay? So you minimize your cost function by hill climbing to you know, make it in a few weeks, and uh, if you reach a point where uh, it does not improve anymore. You just say, okay, re-engineer your code, add the delays here and there, you know, add the registers, you know, change your code because it's not uh, converging, okay? So what usually you have feedback on that. Uh, you try for like even a few hours and then you look at the cost function and you say, okay, the cost function is too big, this is not going to converge. And you change or engineer your code by inserting the proper delays. So, and you also can analyze where is the longest connection. Can I put a register in there to break this connection and things like that. So it's a bit of an interactive process where you run it uh, uh, to the full three weeks. Uh, the worst case usually is just one or two days you run. But you, you kick when you leave the office. And the next day in the morning, you see if it is promising or not. Or sometimes you wait to see where it failed, and you see if you can re-engineer the order to, to make it compile. So this is how it works, usually. Uh, you showed a graph for the uh, number of cycles against the uh, probability of taking a branch. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the graph is not symmetric. So at yeah. the probability of 100% taking the branch, it shows that it will take like more than one cycle. Yeah. So why is that? I mean, if I would because if branch... you have like uh, known zero probability, the compiler is gonna optimize the branch out. So okay. like here, like uh, at this point, the compiler uh, realized that uh, uh, this uh, comparison is not needed and not gonna execute the comparison at all. Okay, I mean on the other side, for 100 percent. For 100 percent, in this kind of like uh, compilation flags, you can check on the GitHub what happens. You can compile this to make sure and disassemble it. Basically, you have an extra instruction here because this comparison happens. Here they do the comparison. Here the compiler doesn't do it. That's why it's not symmetric. No. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, other questions? I've got one about, um, so you described the difference between putting your model into an x86 program and just running on the CPU and yeah. then also modeling 
I, I gloss over what the exact details you said, whether modelling this, the, yep. when, it, when it comes out onto a chip and describe these as different. What extra steps are going on when you're actually simulating? Is it trying to take into account hardware effects? Yeah. Like the point is, like, uh, like I said, here you don't have scheduling. For example, if you miss the delay, or your delay is wrong, you're not going to notice that here, but you're going to notice that here at this point. Does that mean you need to run the entire placement optimizer? No, like the placement optimizer does not change uh, uh, like uh, the behavior of your program. It only changes how things are placed on the chip. So like placing route when you go into the simulation strategy doesn't happen. Because like either like your, your uh, components or a permutation of the same components is going to give you same results. So it doesn't matter at this stage of the simulation if you are running one of another permutation. It only up, uh, matters here after synthesis. Yeah, basically here you have synthesis, and then here, down here, you will have placement route, and then you have the bit stream, and then you have the PGA. So placement route after, uh, uh, like, uh, happens after, after synthesis. Okay? And then my, my other question was going to be, so this place and route algorithm you're saying is exponential. Yep. And but similarly, in the same way that you compile, I don't know, Firefox, it takes two days, but then the second time you come, you would change one line of code and it takes a minute. The same kind of thing surely applies here. If I place all my things, find a valid solution, and then go, okay, I'm going to change one no. gate, then no. I'll no. Because what you're describing is something that uh, should be implemented by partial re uh, reconfiguration, which is a thing that no one does. So incremental changes do reset. Uh, your placement route from scratch. Even if it was the case of changing like an AND gate to an OR gate? In that case, you might get around with it, but I've never seen uh, like a toolchain supporting that. Like, you, in theory, you could do it, but in practice, I don't think it happens. Okay, thank you. Be because there is, a, yeah, there is a lot more going on by changing an AND and an OR, an or in, inside all these steps. So you can cache some of the results you can cache some of the cost function in the place route, but uh, yeah, it's not as easy as you described. No one does that, at least to my knowledge. There might be somewhere some tools that do that, and I'm not aware of it, but I'm not aware of it. Do, do you then cache the place and route of each individual, like Verilog blocks? If I have a, I don't know how it works really, but like a full adder that's been pre compiled and I just plug stuff into it, no. do I have to reroute that? The internally, no. But externally, yes, and this is where the, 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 the problem happens. Because, for example, for a multiplier, usually you have hardware-optimized multiplier targeted to your FPGA given by your vendor. That thing internally don't, doesn't really need to be pleasant route, but the pleasant route algorithm might decide uh, to move things even internally to meet timing. For example, you have an adder and a long delay before the adder, a long wire before the adder. So what happens is that pleasant route might take uh, the input register of the adder and move it towards the source so that uh, the wire gets shorter and the other wire gets longer, but still this, uh, the, the electromagnetic field can reach the, uh, the register and then can reach over. So like, you cannot really cache much. And then finally, I just wanted to talk about, so you, you, you're talking about electromagnetic fields propagating in these wires. When yep. you're doing normal ASICs, you have to take into account things like capacitance between the wires and everything. Cro you're talking about crosstalk and other yeah, things. Yeah. Do you, you, don't, to... you don't really do that on FPGA, but if you are designing an ASIC, you do that. So do you have, like, you, once you design a circuit, you can be pretty sure that it's going to be deterministic, and it's not, the routing algorithm's not going to throw some interference effects no, into the mix? No, that, that is not going to happen, usually, because what happens with FPGAs, usually they have higher transistor uh, size uh, than uh, ASIC. For example, now they are 7 nanometers, but the smallest FPGA is still at 14 nanometers, where they already developed technology to isolate the various... Uh, gates so that you don't have crosstalk. Uh, I never seen it happening, but if you are meeting timing for one picosecond or something, uh, I wouldn't trust that. Like you, the moment you meet timing, you have a number that tells you by how much margin of error you have, and if the margin of error is like very small, I wouldn't trust that bit stream at all. I would for lower my clock frequency so that I have a bit of a buffer zone to allow for these kinds of things. But I've never seen a compilation really failing because of crosstalk. Uh, usually it doesn't happen. Thank you. You're welcome. Yep, go ahead. 
uh, after using HLS, uh, you showed the table where uh, where it says that uh, the computational time for using simulation is shorter than actual hardware. Yeah. Why is it that? Because you're just generating assembly. Okay. Like you're, you're basically here, what happens is that uh, you have something that runs on top of GCC that converts your source code into GCC uh, intermediate. Uh, representation and then you run GCC and you get an executable. So there is basically a bit of overhead because uh, you know you have uh, an extra step to generate uh, your even GCC, you can generate even C++ there, you know, uh, but usually what happens you generate intermediate uh, language uh, for the GCC compiler and then GCC compiles everything and packs it and you execute it on a CPU. So basically, you're taking your description and compiling it to assembly. Because, for example, if you're doing an add, you're, you have an add uh, instantiated uh, onto the FPGA, you can just use the add on your CPU to, to do the same thing, you know? So you can uh, basically want to unmap the instruction that uh, you would have a component on the FPGA for something that already exists on the CPU, and sometimes you need to write an, a wrapper. For example, if you have a 17 bits uh, unsigned integer add, you don't have a 17 bits add on the CPU. So you, you take 32 bits, you part with zeros, you do the addition, and then you zeros the remaining bits so that in case it overflowed, you don't get a number that you can't really represent on the hardware, and your register drops to zero because you overflowed, you know? Like, this is what happens. So that's why it is, uh, it is fast. Uh, more questions? Okay. We've got one more quick one. So, correct me if this is the way I'm thinking here. So, GPUs are very paralyzable in terms of lots of data in. I get data out, but not in terms of branches because I, yeah. I have to go down one branch. Is the gain in the FPGA here that I can both have, for example, you showed that picture with loads of your F of X's. I can do the same on the GPU and here. But this time, I can actually change those branches to so physically change the execution flow down both branches. So, basically, what happens on to an FPGA is that uh, the heap of the branch the first true statement is an order block. The else of the statement is another other block. Both computation happen at the same time, and then you discard the result that you don't need by ending the result with the guard of if. So basically, both of the things happen at the same time, so that's why you don't pay the branch misprediction, but it costs in space. What costs us in time onto a CPU costs us in, the cost is in space on the FPGA. So what is the problem here? If you have tons and tons of branch, branches that uh, get unfolded in hardware and hardware and hardware, you might end up with uh, needing so much hardware that you don't have enough resources to put all of them onto a single FPGA. This is where things fall apart. You don't have enough resources to execute all, all these branches and unfold all of them. And then you need to start thinking, OK, can I use multiple FPGAs? Can I do resource sharing? Because sometimes you can get away with these things if you know, the same uh, branch is in a loop or something. You, you can do some things. So yeah, this is what happens. Is there, so people have started putting GPUs on top of CPUs, like in system on a chip configuration, yeah. to keep all the data and everything local. Is there any hope for, okay, I might have a system on a chip that has both a CPU, a GPU, and an FPGA? Yeah, you already have it. It's called Zinc from Xilinx. So they, they integrate an, air, an ARM CPU and an FPGA. So you write C++ code, and is the compiler going, I reckon I can make this faster on an FPGA? No, no, you still need to manually tell uh, the application that uh, this is FPGA code, please offload it. Yeah. You cannot really have, but even with GPU, you don't have automatic decision, like this goes on the GPU, even if you use PyTorch or something, yeah. you decide, okay, this is CUDA array, this is uh, GPU array, you know, this is going to happen on the GPU. This is not automated yet, but for any accelerator. Thank you.
Okay, so I think uh, we can resume. It's uh, time to resume. Okay, so we were left with uh, how do we avoid that uh, we do all the work and then we have like bad performance and so implicitly we want to avoid crying, okay? So the way we, do, we go about, about this is by doing performance modeling. So what we want to do here, we want to estimate how the FPGA is going to behave in terms of performance before writing a single line of code. This is informally what the goal here is, okay? And we want to take a step back, okay, and uh, analyze the issue from a software engineering perspective. So usually what uh, you go about in software engineering, if you're given a problem P and you're tasked to solve it, okay, the first thing you do, I think you select the best algorithm, okay? And uh, what is the best algorithm? Suggesting? Like how do you decide what is the best algorithm? I think there was a question related to this a moment ago. The one that uses fewer resources? Yeah, like uh, how do you decide the fewer resources? Yeah. Uh, you have to decide the time or the space. Okay, so basically what you're talking about is complexity. Yeah. You want to take uh, the algorithm that has uh, uh, the least complexity, okay? Okay, but then this is the suggestion that you made. Good job. Another thing is you want to linearize memory accesses, okay? Because, for example, if uh, you're doing binary search, okay, plain binary search, com uh, in terms of uh, complexity, is log n is perfect, uh, like you can't really do much better, but in practice, you're jumping around in memory so much that it's quite slow. It can be three slow, faster than scanning everything, but for example, you can use galloping search on other things where they, are allo uh, they allow you to cache a lot of the intermediate steps and bring forth the last one so that you basically reduce the, uh, the, um, the random memory accesses to only three compared to like log n, okay? So this is one example, okay? And Basically, when uh, you're using accelerators, there are additional complications, okay? First of all, PCM Express bandwidth is limited, so if your accelerator is plugged onto the PCI Express bus, you know that uh, there are, uh, on PCI Express 3, 15 gigabytes per second, 16 almost, 15.75 uh, gigabytes per second that you can transfer. So, you know, you're transferring 15 gigabytes, it takes one second. It may be not negligible uh, for what you're doing, okay? And also, you have to think about that the accelerators have both on-die memory and on-chip memory. On-die memory is basically your, similar to what is your CPU cache. It's actually the same technology. And uh, uh, you have on-chip cache, so basically you have DRAM sticks plugged directly uh, to the FPGA. So you don't need to go to, uh, the, through the PCI Express bus to access to DRAM, unless you want to send something to the CPU and have the CPU reading from DRAM, okay? This is not RAM that usually the CPU can access from the FPGA, it's dedicated to the FPGA. But the CPU can transfer data so that the FPGA can buffer it into this DRAM, which is much faster to access because the bandwidth for DDR4 is around 60 gigabytes per second, which is four times the bandwidth that you have over PCI Express, which is 16 almost, okay? So the objective of performance modeling is to understand uh, the uh, major factor that di dictate performance when using uh, uh, compute coprocessors, also accelerators, and bandwidth and latencies of the various interconnect. For example, you have like, uh, sometimes you have an NB link on the GPU where the GPUs can transfer data between themselves, and this also has some bandwidth, 150 gigabytes per second. So you can reasonably fast transfer data GPU to GPU, for example. The capacity, the capacity of different memories, for example, you can buffer data on the dedicated RAM on FPGA or you can transfer data on the VRAM for the GPU. So this is something that you need to take into account when doing the estimation. So implicitly what you're doing here 
is uh, checking the impact of data movement. Because if you're transferring data back and forth because uh, your computation is interleaved with the CPU, then you might end up with a slowdown because most of the time is uh, data waiting in a queue or on, on a buffer instead of uh, uh, being actually done any useful computation. And this is what usually happens when you have random memory accesses, except that this is escalates that you have GPU, CPU, FPGA communication, and uh, so this is becomes more, much more complicated. And uh, for FPGA, you, what you need to take into account is accelerator specific properties. For the GPU, usually is uh, the throughput, like how many CUDA cores you have, what is the size of the L1 cache. This is the thing that matter on a GPU case scenario, how much branching you have, and things like that. On the FPGA, you have the operation space, the arithmetic operation space, how much space you have on chip to put stuff, how many hardware can I fit on this chip, for example, and things like that. The clock frequency, because if you're running your FPGA at 200 megahertz or you're running at 500 megahertz, there is a huge difference in the performance. And uh, fine grain tunable numeric, for example, on an FPGA, you can say, okay, I only need another that is three bits. So you can save a lot of space by only adding three bits instead of adding 32 bits and wasting the remaining, like you do on CPU and GPU. And uh, other custom computing approaches, for example, you can use compression to transfer data, and these kind of things, okay? So this is what you do uh, when you performance. You want to, to factor all uh, these parameters in and get a time time estimate out of it, okay? Um, for FPGA performance, it's easier to, to model it because it's predictable. Like I said at the beginning, like the number of clock cycles is something that you decide. You know how many clock cycles it's gonna take. So if, you, if your architecture, if your model uh, uh, says, okay, uh, I need uh, this amount of other, a loop here, a connect here. In the end, you can say, okay, how, much clock, how many clock cycles it takes from the input to the output. This is a fixed number. No, no, it's never going to be changed, so the performance is fully predictable. Other things, there is uh, no good context switch, garbage collection, uh, background processes, or aliens interfering uh, with uh, your code and changing the performance behind the scenes, okay? And uh, which basically means that uh, your bit stream at the end uh, will be executed the same number of clock cycles every time. This is fixed, it cannot change. And uh, this uh, number of clock cycles can be uh, computed easily. Like this is linear equation really that uh, I usually put in a spreadsheet and use a, not even coding. I just put a spreadsheet and evaluate the various trade-off that I'm making. Uh, there are further in here that if you're interested, you can look at it, okay? But uh, let's analyze a bit a modern PC architecture, okay? As we see here, we have like uh, the CPU, okay? And then there are a few bandwidths. Like, for example, like you have uh, PC Express 4, up to 12 of them, and uh, six gigabytes for each lane. So you can guess the total bandwidth here. Uh, by multiplying the 16 gigabytes by the number of lanes. Same applies for PC Express 3. You have 16 lanes at most at 8 gigabytes per second, okay? Then you have the disk that is up to 6 gigabytes per second that sits here, unless you're using an MVME that sits on the PC Express bus, okay? And usually your accelerator sits somewhere around here, and uh, Possibly we will have a PCI Express 5. We will see about that, I'm not sure. And other things you have here is DDR4 or DDR5, depending on what is your CPU and uh, the bandwidth that they offer, okay? So you kind of have all these things, and you need to see, like, where is my data coming from? From disk, from the 2.5 uh, gigabit uh, Ethernet bus, or, or maybe I plug the fiber optic cable into my FPGA, so my data comes directly from a, a gigabit connection, from the, a 10 gigabit connection onto the FPGA, which is what, acts, uh, what happens in the trigger system. The FPGAs there are basically uh, standalone, where data from the detector comes through fiber optics to the FPGA and leads through another fiber onto the, uh, um, the high-level trigger, okay? So 
In that case, you're bypassing all of this and you're directly talking to the FPGA, which is kind of a best case scenario. But in some cases, you have data coming from the Ethernet port, from uh, uh, the disk, then it goes to the CPU, goes to RAM, and then it travels all around you. And when you model, you want to account for all of that, okay? Uh, and uh, other things you need to account, for example, on a Xilinx U250 uh, data accelerator card, you have four. Uh, 64 gigabytes of DDR4 uh, uh, on board here, which allows you for 77 gigabytes per second data transfer. You can factor that in. You may be transferring data onto the FPGA and storing it there for the entire duration of the computation and then bringing it out to the CPU, bringing only the result out. Okay? You have 54 megabytes of on chip memory, which acts like a CPU cache, but you, you can actually configure what's going in there. Like on the CPU, you are uh, uh, leveraging the prefetcher to bring data onto the on chip memory. When you program FPGA, you are programming and instantiating your own custom prefetch. That's why you mitigate the, the cache misser, because you know what data you need, and you can bring it. Uh, inside the, the on-chip memory beforehand. And this is a bandwidth of 38 terabytes per second, but I'm, you're never going to saturate that. Like, the compute capability of the FPGA is scaled accordingly to that, so you must achieve a 100% utilization, but this is not going to be your bottleneck, okay? And then you have, like, 100 gigabit Ethernet uh, to fiber optic cables coming in and out. You, know, you, you decide how to use it. And uh, you have, like, PC Express over here. This is usually the connection and the memory available onto an FPGA, and then you need to plug that into a system, and this is the kind of uh, speed that you have to bring data in and data out, okay? So what do you do at this point? You know how much time it takes to uh, transfer data, so this is the first tiebreaker. Is transferring the data the bottleneck that makes FPGA acceleration not worth? Can I mitigate this bottleneck? If not, just give up. Don't do it. Like, don't waste your time coding. If you notice instead that you're not bound by the data transfer, okay, then you start saying, okay, let's see how fast the FPGA release at this point, because I know that I'm not bound by the speed of the various interconnect. And the way you do that, like, uh, you do a very nice call graph where I have no idea where things are. You find the, the bottleneck, okay? which uh, we can locate there. Uh, luckily, I did it offline. Uh, okay? And then you decide, okay, I want to accelerate the, this thing. Okay? Uh, how much data do I need to transfer to accelerate this thing? How much data I need to take back at the end? And you see how much time it's going to take. Okay, this is taking too much. Can I also add uh, these other blocks? together, because this may be a data generator, so can I move the data generator onto the device so that I don't need to pay the cost of transferring data because I can generate it on the device itself. And this is how you go until you find a suitable point where you can cut, okay? And as I, this goes onto the CPU, this goes onto the FPGA, because I know at this point I'm, the data transfer time is very small and it's going to slow me down, okay? At this point, you have this thing. Basically, if you are compute bound, because now you can uh, see, okay, what the FPGA needs to do, you can see how many clock cycle is going to take by making an hypothesis of, of the architecture, and uh, uh, you see if uh, your bottleneck is computational, then you are you're, you're good because then you can optimize the algorithm or increase the clock frequency. By increasing the clock frequency, we boil down to adding additional registers to like cut down the propagation time of the electromagnetic field so they can reach higher clock frequency because in the end you decide the clock frequency based on where the registers are and what place and route tells you okay what is the cost function because if uh, it is uh, uh, like if you are aiming too high for the clock uh, frequency then the the propagation time of the electromagnetic field is too much you're never going to meet them then you lower and lower your clock frequency until you can make it on time Okay? These are the things. But at that point, you can decide to add additional register, pipeline, and other techniques that are uh, commonly used in the FPGA world. Nothing is really complicated at this stage, and this is something that you can pick up really quickly if you're into that. And uh, you can add uh, these and follow these good practices to put registers and increase the clock frequency, which is going to make your program run faster. 
If you're IO bound, like I said uh, before, you can try to offload more things to try to offload the data generator as well onto the FPGA, even if it is not a simulation bottleneck, to reduce the IO burden. Other things you can do are caching, compression, your pick. Like uh, if, you, if you have a smart way to cache data, then you maybe resolve your issue. If you already have like uh, compression available to, to you, for example, GPU uh, implements uh, nowadays an hardware compression chip, so you can use the gzip to zip things and not compress them really fast onto the GPU. So, but you, you, you need to know that when you go about compression, the compression step itself is going to take some time. So like uh, compression, data transfer time, uh, make your equation based on the bandwidth where the compressor can, can compress data and uh, move on to that. And basically, you iterate multiple times until the theoretical limit is reached or you met your performance requirement. For example, in the CERN case, you have like, uh, you know the time between bunch crosses, so you know your time budget. At the moment you are below the time budget, you're done. You don't need to further optimize because you are, uh, you, uh, you are meeting the, the requirements. Of course, the requirements may change over time, so you might do further optimization and other things. But uh, let's move on to an example of what uh, is one of my performance models. Like I said, I take into account the, the compute accelerator characteristics. In this case, uh, how many bits I need for the arithmetic, which basically tells me how many DSPs, DSPs are a functional unit, unit onto the FPGA, I will need onto an FPGA. Then uh, I will see how many of the total DSPs are here, I have an utilization, usually I aim for 80% of the utilization, so that they, if I need a few extra, I know that I have them, because when I do this kind of analysis, I'm always in a worst case scenario, where I use a very conservative clock frequency, very conservative amount of resources, and if uh, I'm uh, uh, fast enough at this point, I know that uh, when I actually do the work, I'm only going to be faster, but never slower. So when I decide to do some sort of acceleration, I'm always doing in worst case scenario analysis so that then uh, in the worst case I'm still having good performance. In the best case I'm doing better, okay? And then uh, basically what I do, I also look at the CPU parameters, the dimensional place, how much time it takes, and this all factors in. And then uh, basically the first thing I do, I analyze how much time it takes to transfer data, okay? Here is very low, we are 10 uh, to the power minus four uh, seconds, so it, in this case was accept acceptable, and the way I compute that is very crude. I mean, you take the number of ele elements, uh, you have the size of the single element, because if it is float, it's 32 bits, if it is double, it's 64, and so on. You multiply and you get how, much, how many megabytes you have, you have the bandwidth, and then you go there. Very simple equation at this point. And here, if you already see that most of your time is spent here, uh, then you have no chance of meeting the requirement, okay? So the point is where either you stop or continue. This is the first check that everyone does. Then uh, we move on and we analyze uh, how much uh, it takes uh, from uh, uh, everything on CPU, everything on CPU, this was on MATLAB, uh, the starting point. Then we use uh, like uh, GPU and CPU then FPGA and GPU, and then uh, FPGA and uh, CPU, but this was kind of like, uh, there. But this is not really meaningful. There is not even a time uh, there because it didn't really make any sense. It was just uh, the easiest uh, thing to do at the time. Okay, then basically we have a time estimate. We have that uh, entire on the CPU takes 580 seconds. If uh, we move on to uh, uh, having an FPGA, plus a GPU, we go down to four seconds or something, okay? This is a kind of an heterogeneous approach, but in the end, what uh, you, hand, you have here is how much time it's gonna take, okay? And if I give you a summary, because this is like a screenshot, uh, not everything fits into the page, we have that uh, but the first attempt takes uh, 16 seconds by offloading only some things onto the FPGA. If we do everything on the CPU, we take 24 seconds. The original code base was taking more than one minute, and if we move on to uh, uh, CPU plus GPU, we are at 18 seconds. Uh, 
barely beating uh, the F barely, the FPGA is barely beating the GPU. But then, if we move on into having some of it onto the FPGA, some of things some things on a GPU in an heterogeneous fashion, then we get down to less than 10 seconds, okay? So this is the way I, I go about the performance modeling. I factor all the, the things into that. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time to do the resource estimation and see uh, what kind of resources you have on an FPGA and how you decide how many of which you need for each operation. But uh, there are also tools that simplify your life on that. Uh, and uh, if you're interested, we, we can discuss uh, in another uh, time about that, okay? So this is uh, your design flow by the addition of HLS and, by, and with the addition of performance modeling. So basically, most of my time when I do FPGA programming is spent here. I take the problem uh, definition, I draft an architecture, I model uh, the architecture, and, you know, I reiterate uh, many times until I meet the time requirements. And usually what is the cutoff for me is like I want to achieve at least one order magnitude speed up compared to either CPU or GPU, depending on which one is best. If I don't achieve at least one order magnitude speed up, then it's not worth because writing the code is going to take one order of magnitude more time, more engineering time. So I want to trade off. I'm going to take 10 times more. Uh, it's going to take me 10 times the effort but I want to have at least 10 times the return. This is my personal uh, way to go about this. Everyone has his own uh, requirements. But on iterating many times here, you have your final architecture. Then you implement it in HLS. That's what I usually do, which uh, then goes down all to the pipeline that we're familiar with. And in the end, we get onto the device, and we do a benchmark, and we see if the platform matches the model. And at this point, if you did the modeling correctly, this is either a perfect match or a slightly imperfect match, but uh, with a couple of tweaks, which means that uh, at most running a couple of times, this plays and route, maybe five or six, uh, like a, a reasonable amount of uh, a plays and route will give you the performance you're looking for or even better. Okay? So this is why there is this arrow and that's why it's dash. This is uh, like... Uh, not always needed. Sometimes you do the benchmark, you resolve the problem, you're done, and then you go parting, okay? Uh, now I want to give you an example of something uh, realistic. Uh, and this is some work that uh, we did uh, with Monte Carlo, okay? And this is a physics uh, problem applied to medicine in which we are simulating uh, electromagnetic elastic scattering, basically. So we have a beam of electron, a pencil beam, so all electrons arrive with the same energy and direction inside a medium, which can be water, gold, can be anything. Uh, they are going to tra traverse uh, this medium and be scattered. And then, basically, we take where they arrive uh, at the end, like... Uh, uh, okay, like this, okay? We take uh, where they end up with, and we aggregate uh, uh, the results to plot some histogram and see uh, what is the energy distribution at the end. That, that's what we do. Uh, it's a very basic example, but meaningful, because the steps uh, that uh, are required to make this work are the same as uh, any more meaningful computation, more involved. We the only difference here, we in the end, we didn't need uh, the onboard uh, DRAM, which is a bit of a simplification, but still, uh, this is a nice instantiation of a performance model, okay? So first of all, like I said multiple times, not all workloads benefit uh, from FPGA acceleration. So FPGA have higher throughput than CPUs, GPUs, if, okay, uh, you have many branch misprediction, many cache misses, optionally you're embarrassingly parallel because you can replicate the order multiple times as we saw onto the FPGA, so you can exploit parallelism on the order. Uh, independency is a characteristic that I put there just because it makes your life easier. So if all these computational box uh, can operate independently, uh, you can achieve higher performance because you don't need to reorder data in the end if you execute them out of order, which reduces overhead, which 
can give you a bit of a boost in the performance, sometimes a meaningful boost, but in any case, it's going to make uh, your life much easier. And in the case of Monte Carlo, we are lucky because uh, in this particular simulation fits all the boxes, so it's very promising. If uh, none of these uh, boxes were ticked, and by none of these, I mean the, f the first two, I would have stopped and said, okay, this is not suitable for FPGA, let's uh, use another algorithm. So this is your first check, and checking this, how much it takes, half an hour maybe, one hour. So you already saved the months of work by being careful in, uh, when making a decision, okay? And uh, then the next thing you do, like I said, you find the bottleneck, so you want to decide what to accelerate and you apply all these things to, to decide, okay, if I only offload uh, this particular box, data transfer time is this amount, computation time is this amount, and you, you move what's going on to the FPGA, you change it until you reach something that makes you happy. And when you do that, you also factoring, occurs how much time the FPGA is gonna take to do the computation. And uh, this is the same up to this point for the GPU. The workload characteristics are different. Uh, you want uh, parallelism is mandatory, uh, not, ma not branching, not uh, cache misprediction. And also here, you're basically factoring uh, the teraflops of a GPU and uh, how much branch misprediction you have to kind of get like the performance. Like This is the same up to this point for whatever acceleration you're, accelerator you're using, okay? So for me, uh, like I said before, before we all, we always, I always assume that uh, uh, the FPGA should achieve at least one order magnitude speed up over CPU. And by, uh, by over CPU, I mean that you have a meaningful baseline, like a modern, uh, like a reasonable code, reasonably optimized code for the CPU that is also parallel. Because if you're comparing a single core uh, Pentium 2 against uh, like a recent FPGA with a code base that was written by you when you were in your first year bachelor and you didn't even know uh, what C++ was, you know, and use that as a baseline, this is not a meaningful baseline. You first want a meaningful baseline, and then if you need it, you accelerate it, okay? And uh, in our uh, simulation, we noticed that uh, the simulation of one particle takes uh, 32, 34 or 35 iterations. And by assuming an FPG architecture, this is way oversimplificating the finding of the model, but uh, I had to compress it into one slide, so this is what we end up with. So we are making assumption of an architecture capable of computing one iteration per clock cycle, which you can do it by deeply pipelining uh, the code base. To achieve a 10x speed up, the FPGA should achieve at least 250 megahertz in clock frequency, or a parallelism bigger than one. If you can simulate at least two particles at the same time onto an FPGA, then even with half of this clock frequency, you can meet uh, this 10x speed up that I wanted to achieve, okay? This basically led me to the modeling phase where I measured the data requirements, the arithmetic operation, and then by factoring in the, the FPGA resources, I computed the limiting factor, and the limiting factor basically gave me the parallelism. How much resources do I need to uh, simulate one particle? How many resources I have available onto the device? And you divide the two number, you get your parallelism, okay? So, uh, how you measure the resource requirement? For example, inside the computation we had two arrays, and the way you compute the memory requirement is very simple. You just take the size of, of the data type, you multiply by the size of the array, and you, add all, you do this for all the arrays you have in the code base. And this gives you the memory footprint of your computation, so how many resources uh, you need to store everything onto the FPGA. And you need to do that line by line. You cannot use a tool for that because these arrays are fixed. Once uh, you decide that uh, the hardware should have this array, you cannot dynamically allocate an array onto the FPGA. The hardware is there, fixed, placed, and routed. You cannot change it. So if you measure the footprint uh, using uh, like a tool like Perf or something, 
Uh, you will not get this number, you will get uh, how much data is allocated at the same time, which is a different number from what you statically need to fit everything, okay? So you need to do that by hand. With one API, there are tools that you can feed uh, the code base and it will give you a number at the end. But uh, this is quite recent as a tool. I, haven't, I don't have much experience with that, but uh, I expect it to, to be decent at the very least if they are selling it. And uh, in the future, these tools are going to be more and more available. Okay? Like for uh, the resource measurement in terms of arithmetic, for example, what you do is you go line by line and say, okay, I have an adder here and a multiplier here. So basically, what I need at the end here is two single precision addition, two single precision multiplication. Then I go to a table and I see one single addition, how much uh, DSP is going to take. Uh, and one single multiplication, how, mu how much uh, is going to take. Then I say, okay, I need two DSPs for addition, three DSPs for multiplication times two. I need 10 DSPs for these two lines of code. This is the result to it. We have other uh, resources, LUTs, uh, flip-flops onto the FPGA, but in scientific computing, usually the, the limitation factor is the DSPs. So since it, this is very easy to estimate, this is your first estimation, and only if needed, you go further and analyze other resources. If this, is, if this fits, then uh, you are basically done. Okay, so what we did after that is that uh, with a parallelism equal one, our DSP utilization is 127, and the on-chip memory requirement is 10 megabit. Megabit, no megabyte, okay? So the FPGA used uh, in our study had uh, six, uh, 670K uh, DSPs and 345 megabit of on-chip memory. So basically means that a parallelism of one takes uh, 1.86 uh, DSPs in percentage and 3.35 uh, on-chip memory resources which basically means that our limi limiting factor is the on-chip memory, okay? And the theoretical parallelism is 15 because we only want to consume 50% uh, of the off-chip memory resources. Do you have any idea why we only want to use 50% of the memory resources? Okay. So, like I said before, HLS is going to do scheduling for you. Scheduling requires the addition of registers and FIFOs, which, and the FIFOs especially, are taken from these resources. So, usually, my rule of thumb, which anyone has his own at this point, is just whatever works for you, is that I only aim to use 50% of the memory resources to leave the compiler another 50%, which is a worst case scenario. And once you run uh, place and route, actually synthesis in this case, which takes one hour, once you run synthesis for the first time, you can check uh, the metric, and uh, at that point you can already see, oh, oh, it takes this many resources, I can increase the parallelism. Okay, and this takes, uh, if your parallelism is a parameter and the only thing that changes after your first resource measurement when you do the synthesis, this tuning up this number is only going to take um, half a day at most, very fast, okay? Which uh, left us with the resulting architecture where we have the particle generator and an RNG that generates 96 bits per clock cycle that uh, feeds into a particle simulator that generates raw data for simplicity we left uh, the aggregation on the CPU. If uh, we did uh, the aggregation onto the FPGA, this would have achieved an even higher speed up, but we were happy with the result, so we decided that this is a necessary complication. So it's, it doesn't matter if uh, we are spending a bit more time transferring data, okay? And we replicated this instance that you see here 15 times to achieve to fill the chip. And basically, the, the, what happened in the end, we had five instances for each SLR. Basically, the SLR is a partition of the chip. You get, this is similar to a CPU core, like the FPGA to increase the amount of resources, they glue together multiple chips with some interconnect. And, and so we, we minimize the transfer between SLR, because that might kill your clock frequency, which is a very nice side effect of our architecture. And uh, we replicated until we almost filled the entire FPGA, and this is we ended up with to increase the throughput. And then we did some measurements. 
We did a measurement, and as expected, the limiting factor was the chip memory, and with scheduling overhead, we needed 300 megabit, which is higher than 50%, as you can see, and account for 86%. But uh, at the same time, this is good because uh, we still fit onto, uh, onto the device. If uh, this was higher than 100%, we need to re-engineer a uh, change the architecture to reduce this number, while in this case it worked, and we can always further increase uh, the parallelism. In this case, particularly, we could have reduced the parallelism because it's a small example, but in some cases where you, don't, you cannot tune the parallelism, this may be a significant task changing this number. DSPs, as we saw, wasn't really an issue, it was only 1%, and in the end we end up only with 30% of the resource utilization, which is roughly one-third of uh, what we saw over there. Like we were seeing that we needed three times the memory resources, and this is more or less what we see here, okay? And uh, another thing, higher parallelism uh, could limit the achievable clock frequency, and this goes, the boils down to the permutation overhead of present route. So by increasing uh, the number of things you have to permute, your, your, uh, the complexity increases exponentially, so it might, it might be much harder to find a permutation that meets your clock frequency, and this might cause you to lower the clock frequency. By having instead more free spots to uh, move things around, you might achieve higher clock frequency. But this is a rule of thumb. Uh, like, uh, you also have literature on that, but uh, uh, you just need to be aware about this, that the more you fill the chip, the harder it is to reach an high clock frequency, the uh, less filled it is, the easiest it is to achieve an high clock frequency, okay? Then we did some benchmark. And like I said, we want a meaningful baseline. So we wanted to use a recent CPU for that, not a 15 years old CPU. And we wanted to use a parallel implementation that leverage all cores in, for, for a baseline. And we compare that with an FPGA, which is also mid-range. See, this is not even the highest end uh, CPU because we have server CPUs with many more cores. So we didn't aim for the most uh, expensive FPGAs out there. We can try to match uh, uh, like uh, Q, uh, um, Q hardware in the same uh, bin in terms of pricing uh, occurs. This is scaled on a consumer scale. This is on an enterprise scale, so like order of magnitude is different, but we'll see how money comes uh, into place here. The tool chain is Max Compiler uh, 2021, uh, Vivado 2019.2, and we used OpenMP for parallelization. Uh, these are the simulation configuration because the source code is public, you can replicate it if you want to, but 100 million histories to achieve statistical uh, relevance, six MEV beam in water, and we also limited the clock frequency to 200 megahertz because we want it to be toolchain independent. So we use Max Compiler, but if you use SQL, uh, One API, XLS, or whatever, you might not reach higher than 200 megahertz uh, in terms of clock frequency. But with every toolchain, you should easily reach 200 megahertz in clock frequency. So we wanted our results to be portable in other toolchains. And we also see how uh, toolchain specific uh, uh, optimization can change the performance. Okay, moving on to uh, the results. The FPGA acceleration was 110 times faster than a multi core implementation, and if we factor the cost of the two platforms, we have a 10x cost equivalent speed up, which in some cases you don't have a money issue. But in research, uh, you always have a money issue. So you want to maximize the value that you get out of your money. And uh, this is a way, because in this case, if you use an FPGA, you achieve 10 times, uh, 110 times the performance with one tenth of the cost, which is very good, in my opinion, very good result. The theoretical result given by the model was 128x, but that was for a slightly more optimized version, which was doing the data aggregation onto the FPGA, uh, when we realized that we, actually, we were way overshooting in terms of uh, uh, performance. We didn't bother with that, but you know, in theory you can achieve that. And using uh, toolchain-specific uh, optimization, like uh, toolchain-specific uh, um, 
yeah, uh, which only applies if you use max compiler as we did into this example, we can achieve 300 megahertz without changing the code at all. Uh, in theory, we can achieve even higher if we start tying our code to the compiler so that the compiler generates the best, uh, uh, the best uh, hardware given uh, the FPGA. But just uh, by enabling all this optimization, we achieved uh, 100x, uh, 160x speed up, which uh, can tell you that this is kind of a worst case scenario. Um, okay, just to show it graphically, this is where your CPU performance is, and this is where your FPGA performance is. So, like, it's quite a huge gap. And to conclude uh, this lecture, this presentation, this introduction, I say that um, FPGAs are gaining a lot of uh, uh, popularity due to HLS because. Now you can put something onto the FPGA in a reasonable amount of time, and uh, the, also the rise of uh, uh, graph uh, neural network and this kind of computation or ultra low latency inference is uh, creating a need for uh, these devices, even in industry or in the in consumer space, not yet, but at least in industry uh, there is a use case for that, and. Um, Again, like uh, there is also the availability of this device on the cloud, so now you can play with them and use them without you know, making a, an investment. So you can do explorative research just uh, by using AWS. Um, the FPGAs can be multiple order of magnitude faster than CPUs and GPUs, but the keyword is when accelerating suitable workloads. Uh, FPGAs are not a panacea. They don't solve uh, all the problems. You need to take a smart decision to get the performance you want. And uh, this basically means that uh, you need a formal methodology. So you need uh, a sequence of steps that you can always follow and uh, tool chains that simplify your, uh, your work and still achieve a good enough performance. And so basically with even no programming experience, no FPGA programming experience, you can actually program an FPGA. When, when I started my PhD, I didn't have any FPGA programming experience, and I will tell you more. These results were obtained by one of the master students that did his final year project with me, and he didn't have any FPGA experience. This is all it works. It, I just give him like super advising, and you know, they can't kind of support any master student needs. So just to say that uh, HLS greatly reduced the budget to get into, the, into this and you have available. Uh, just a few mentions in case you are interested in working with us. There are few collaborations available and uh, one of the projects uh, that we are uh, searching for master students to do some exploratory work is to do uh, training uh, uh, AI on FPGA, and this is something that doesn't really work yet. Uh, so basically, training needs to be approximated and not doing a back propagation. So we are searching for someone that has uh, like a machine learning AI experience to kind of uh, do a selection of uh, what we can use to do training and what are the trade-off when. Uh, we move on to the FPGA. So there are like three parts here. The first part is to search for all possible uh, and useful training algorithms. Part two will be to, to see which one is suited for FPGA acceleration. And part three will be to integrate into HLS for ML, which is part of the, of the loop. And the two main driving force here are uh, the developers of uh, two of the state-of-the-art libraries, one for continual AI and the other for uh, uh, HLS, for machine learning on QDFPJ. And you can see, you can check them on GitHub. They have tons of stars and tons of uh, relevance. Uh, another possible collaboration is to uh, offload some a GNN and implement it onto an FPGA. Uh, this is in collaboration with the hardware Carmio kind of experiment in Japan and we are still searching for someone to take the GNN and put it on an FPGA, or 
Uh, here you have also two options. Like you can uh, the design the GNN. If you are into ML, you can work on designing a very a GNN that solves our problem and achieves high accuracy. And if you want to contact us, you can mail me. These slides are available on the Indico page. You can take my email there. Yeah, you, you need to tell me like some information, like uh, the project that you want to work on, and uh, if it is part-time or full-time because you have exams and other things. And you need to sort out the logistics with your own institution. I'm not going to do any paperwork for you because I don't care about that. And uh, you will do that. I can at most uh, sign you something that you did your thesis and talk with your supervisor. We can arrange a meeting. But uh, paperwork and making sure that your university is happy with you is up to you. And you should attach your CV because I need to make a selection. Uh, because there are uh, quite a few emails that I receive about this every time. So I only take around three people every year. So there is a bit of competition uh, with, for these spots. So I cannot guarantee to take manual. Otherwise, I will be doing supervision instead of doing my research, which is not really what I'm paid for. And uh, that's it. Questions? Do you, do you have a recommendation for what kind of like development boards are for pick up a ball for like people at home rather than uh, data center kind of great stuff? For FPGA? Yeah. You have no chance of buying any meaningful board for yourself. Like even the cheapest is few thousand euros. Okay. <laughs> you just use AWS if you want that. Uh, work in simulation and pay 10 euros for an AWS instance and run your code over there. But even present route is something that requires a strong server to, to be executed. Sometimes you need uh, 200, 300 gigabytes of RAM to execute it. Uh, because you want to brute force your way out of it by running a lot of instances. So it's not something you can run on your laptop, really. Um, it's not a question, but I'm a little bit confused by your answer because, I mean, I remember like a couple of years back, I got myself an FPGA board that was around $80 or something. Yeah, you can use that, but this is a toy. It's not an FPGA. Like, yeah, I mean, uh, with that, uh, uh, you can do offload maybe one or two lines of code. Maybe you can write a signal modulator for something where you receive uh, some analog or digital signals and you're processing in an Arduino fashion. But you're not going to do any meaningful... Uh, uh, oh, yeah, of course, yeah. It's more like an uh, FPGA Arduino. Like, yeah. Yeah. You, you can use that for, for this kind of things where you have a like, stringent latency requirement. You want to be really fast for something really simple. So you don't want to use an Arduino, then you can use a very cheap FG, FPGA to achieve that. But well, when we talk about uh, the project uh, the listed year, oh, yeah, you, you, or like any, even if you want to do matrix multiplication or any meaningful uh, computation, even a toy example is going to require you uh, like a decent FPGA. So most of the people, like, they just analyze things on the cloud. Without, and if they, if, uh, they manage to get something useful, Using the results they achieved on the cloud, they apply for funding to get the equipment and, and scale it up. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Anyway. More questions? Oh, yeah. If I remember correctly, you said at the beginning that um, this reducing um, time overhead um, is uh, the, the, the examples where the, the FPGAs are, are used are, for example, trading or uh, triggers at CERN, but the FPGAs are not applicable um, in situation computation that takes, I don't know, like weeks or days. But actually, what you described, uh, those last few projects, like clearly uh, suggest that there are some, some computations taking days, weeks, I don't know, hours, yeah. uh, which could be sped up on the um, on FPGAs. So what I missed. <laughs> OK, the point is like here I was talking about latency, OK? When we talk about latency, not throughput, the scale is microseconds. When we talk about uh, throughput, then the scale can be how much time as you want. So if you take, oh, my computation takes a week, and this is my latency, then uh, basically, uh, the time you save by not creating uh, a threat on, is negligible compared to how much the time the, the simulation takes, okay? 
So when you talk about latency and FPGA, you talk about microseconds. When you talk about uh, uh, throughput, so then there is no time limit, really. Okay? These are two coins or the two, two things. For example, for latency computation, you might not have branches, you might not have cache misses. Those two things are false, though, so there's, the application ticks none of the boxes that are listed, but still the FPGA achieves lower latency than software. But instead, if your computation takes weeks and is throughput oriented, okay, then you need the computation to be either with many cache misprediction, cache faults, sorry, or branch misprediction. And then it makes sense to have an FPGA. Does it answer? Uh, yeah, so those two boxes are, are like yes or no questions if we want to optimize throughput, not... Uh, yeah, okay. only for throughput, exactly. Yeah. Uh, thanks for uh, clarifying this point. Uh, maybe one... Oh, maybe, uh, you can go ahead. Uh, maybe one more, because sometimes you're using... Um, I think, may, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I sometimes I felt that, that you use FPGA or a DSP like... Um, yeah, yeah, like one, sometimes you use one, sometimes, sometimes the other. Is it like the synonym or not? No, no, no. DSP is just a resource available in your FPGA. So the FPGA usually has four kinds of resources. You have uh, uh, flip-flops, you have LUTs, you have DSPs, and you have uh, BRAM and URAM, like in the Xilinx says, or memory, let's say memory. So uh, DSPs are basically a generalization of a multiplier. So whenever you do multiplication or floating point addition, fixed point addition, no, is not done on the DSP. But for these operations, you have a dedicated resource available to you that uh, makes it possible. Because if you are floating something that does a lot of multiplications or a lot of floating point arithmetic, without DSPs, you have no chance of fitting that on a chip, okay? So it's just something available to you onto an FPGA. Uh, maybe. Yeah, so basically it's what you have here. Like this is LUTs, these are flip-flops, and you can assume this is your interconnect. And in addition to these things, you have also DSPs that are connected and memory that are connected. And you are deciding what to locate to which function and how to connect them when you write your code. Not at that low level unless you write HDL, like... Uh, HLS is going to take care of all these things for you, uh, but this is what happens uh, behind. Okay? More questions? Okay, I guess then uh, we are done. And thanks for attending, and have a nice rest of the day. <laughs>